Uh, and funnel cake spiral galaxies M fifty one and M one hundred one. Does that give me a chance to go? Blah, 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 Amy, <laughs> M fifty one is grand design. Oh, whatever. <laughs> okay, sorry, I yelled into my mic. Please Amy. forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm going squee. Amy's here. Yay! Hi, Amy. It's Michael over, over to AFM Radio. How are you? We need your audio, Amy. <laughs> Amy, you're muted. Okay. How about now? Oh wait. Yay! No. Yeah. How about now? Yes, we can hear Wonderful. you. Good. Yay, sorry, new computer. I forgot that I had to install the whole thing. You look to great. Make it work. How oh, it's good to meet your voice again. Still yeah, have. because the last <laughs> time I, I saw a picture of you on because uh, I, I follow oh, your yeah. Google Plus feed, you didn't look quite as good. Yeah, I had a tube down my nose. That was last yeah. time. <laughs> now, did you take, we were arguing online whether you took that picture. Was that a selfie or did somebody take that picture? No, I, I took that. You oh, you did that. take it. I okay, did, so, yeah. Nicole, you were right. I had, I, I I had, had very uh, little to do in the hospital. <laughs> I had uh, my my argument was that you, somebody took that picture and you were hoping the tube was a little longer so you could strangle them with it. But uh, no, no, if it's a selfie, then, then no, we're good. it was it was my own doing. No. Yeah. Well, you you're sound great. Me. It's good to see you in the new place with all the boxes behind yeah, you. Yeah, I still haven't unpacked my office. I have no. bookshelves to be built on the floor, but That'll had an me. IKEA related injury last night, so oh, no. tackle it again today. <laughs> How are you guys holding up? We're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so just to let you know, I haven't unpacked my office fully yet, and I've been here for a little over a year. Yeah. So <laughs> how do you get but, your things? It's driving me crazy that I'm trying uh, it's to just research in a corner. things, write articles, and I can't get my books. It's just the stuff I need the least is still are still in boxes <laughs> in a corner, and it's like just piles of old paperwork at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. That's sounds about right. Yep, yep, yep. So, Amy, uh, you, of course, are one of our regulars on the Weekly Space Hangout. It's so good to have you back after your move uh, across the continent and between yeah. countries. So, uh, yay, awesomeness. Um, and you are the really the guru of, of manned spaceflight history. Of, of, of <laughs> so. What a title. <laughs> you are. You know, you just, you just know so much. And I wish you had uh, unpacked some more of your space models. I don't know if you have yeah. any on hand. I have, well, I have a couple. I have the Apollo uh, command service module. And Excellent. the lunar module. You can't, you can't see them. I don't have a place that I can okay. put them. Okay. They were never... The truth now, they were never really packed in a box. They traveled in your purse the entire way, right? No, my, my actually, I do have a miniature one that I carry in my purse at all times. That oh, there's one the is space out of reach. Oh, yes, this is Pete Conrad, the cat. Ah. <laughs> the internet He's, is full of cats. It is, and so is my desk right now. They're having a lot of fun exploring my new furniture. So oh, Lord. I apologize for when a cat butt just kind of wanders across. <laughs> Welcome to my life. <laughs> Tim moved in with his cat, and I get jinx butt all the time. <laughs> and I'm a lizard. Nice. Amy, I stuck around just long enough to say hi because I just had to say hi to you. It's been so long. But if you ladies will excuse me, i got to get some stuff ready on astronomy.fm for a British program coming up this afternoon. So, uh, Nicole, Pamela, I'm here if you need me. Thank you Thank so, you so much, much, Michael. It's You're good welcome. to say hi, Michael. an amazing help. Yeah. We'll talk to you ladies soon. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, so Amy, yeah, so when I first met Amy in person finally at Science Online, you actually did have uh, some, I think it was a lunar module in your purse. Yeah, it's, that's the one I usually carry. It's, it's just out of reach right now. I don't want to get up and crumple through boxes, but yeah, that's the one I carry in my purse just to, uh, you know. Conversation starter. It's a conversation starter. Well, what's really great is I do this when I meet, um, when I meet, you know, engineers or space people, I can pull this thing out of my purse and say, this is the stuff that I work on. And then when I follow up for interviews or information and stuff, I can say, I was that kid with the space toy in her purse. And they're like, oh, yeah, you. <laughs> so uh, it makes me memorable. We'll call it that. That's always helpful. That is always helpful. So today there's a, a, a rather major anniversary in women's space flight. Yeah. Uh, something that we mentioned on the uh, Space Hangout on Friday. Maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about that here as well. Since we have all ladies in the chat right now. It's all, it's all ladies. Um, sorry, I missed the green room. Should I put up my lower third? Can I do that? Sure, one? go for yes, it. Please. It's, fi it's fine. Yeah. We, know, we know your old hat at this. So this <laughs> Tim is a little sad face that you didn't go say hi to him. But that's, I, that's um, okay. I don't. I didn't. I didn't get the notice. I'm not okay. sure what's going on with um, 
I don't know if it's a circle issue, but um, yeah, so the anniversary that's today, we're, and it seems like it's been a bit of a quiet one online. I don't know if you guys have seen more noise about this, but it's the 50th anniversary of women in space. Um, today in 1963, Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman to go into orbit. Um, her, her mission, just sort of in brief, was the, she was the pilot of Vostok 6, which was the last spacecraft of the Vostok program, and she flew a joint mission with Vostok 5. Uh, I can't remember the cosmonaut's name off the top of my head, but I can look it up. Um, they they flew a joint mission that was it was very similar to the Vostok three four mission that wasn't a rendezvous in orbit, but by virtue of their orbits, they just happened to pass close to each other in orbit, so it looked like they were doing a lot of stuff together, and they kind of chatted in space, but. Um, it was, she was up in space for three days, I think she had 48 orbits in about a little under 70 hours, and um, she was a trained parachutist before she became a cosmonaut, which was good, because like, like they did in the Vostok days, she ejected from her capsule at the last minute, um, and landed by a parachute in a field somewhere. <laughs> That is is so totally <laughs> insane. You are in a capsule descending from space. You have undergone calcium uh, degener decalcification of your bones. Uh, you have just finished ex decelerating multiple Gs, and now you're going to jump out of a moving spacecraft and parachute. Yes. <laughs> you have to maintain that much presence of mind, somehow physicality. Um, I, I think it was on Vostok 2 that German Titov exercised by doing like isometric contractions, like pushing against his control panel because they had nothing, nowhere to move. And they're like, we need to make sure that your muscles don't completely atrophy because you have to land on your own legs and survive. So he would be like pushing against these things and like contracting his abs to make sure that he stayed in shape, which, you know, after three days in space, you're not suffering that much bone density loss or muscle sort of weakening, but still, you know, <laughs> worry. Yeah, that's, that's not a comfortable situation and, to imagine. And the part you're leaving out is they launch with a shotgun in case they come down where there's wolves. Yes, yes. that's the difficulty of landing yes. on land as opposed to in the water. <laughs> yeah, well, we have sharks. I don't think, don't I don't think NASA sent the, sent the, the astronauts up no. with, like, like uh, Triton spears, you know, those... those Harpoons. Uh, <laughs> Harpoons, that's the one. <laughs> like the little mermaid's dad had, those things. <laughs> to go, like, shark Tridents. Spears. Tridents, that's the one. Um, no, I don't think there was, like, a little travel trident. <laughs> Would have been good, though. Um, but apparently, I actually learned from um, ESA astronaut Samantha... I can't remember how to pronounce her last name. She's going up in 2015, I think. Astro, I think she's Astro Sam on Google Plus and on Twitter. But um, she actually commented on that article and told me that they do still have guns in the Soyuz official emergency Soyuz pack. They still um, land they on land. So yeah, they still land on land. They don't. They haven't actually taken a gun up in a few years. But it is still listed as one of the official safety precaution measures that's included in their landing so, kit. <laughs> but when did they last have to take a gun out? I. I I think the only, the only time I know of off the top of my head that they actually took the gun out was in 1965 after, after the Voskhod 2 capsule came down in a forest in the Ural Mountains and they there were wolves around and they had they were in such deep snow and in such deep woods that nobody could actually get to them to get them out. Um, so they had to spend a week or a night, a week would be terrible, a night in the forest. Um, they had to kick off the door of their capsule to get out. Um, this was the mission on which uh, Alexei Leonov had made the first spacewalk, and he was drenched in sweat from the oh. physical exertion of maneuvering in space and trying to get back in the tiny airlock. Yeah. Um, and, you know, their, their long underwear was soaked through, and then he's sitting in, like, negative 30-degree temperatures overnight in the snow, and they can hear wolves. They're like, all right, we're going we're gonna to try to get as safe as possible. Their capsule was wedged in trees, and they managed to get back inside it but couldn't shut a door, so they were open. And they had the gun in case the wolves came, and rescuers did see them, but they were, like, you know, farmer planes and civilian helicopters that had no none of the hardware necessary to lower down a proper ladder for these guys in bulky spacesuits with boots on to climb up. So the oh, next really? day, the next day rescuers came and they actually had to ski in, <laughs> uh, which is so Russian. Um, 
ski in and like create a clearing for a rescue helicopter. So they actually spent a second night in the forest, but because the rescuers had arrived, they had food and they had a fire and a hut, but they had to build a hut to rescue these, these cosmos. So wolves are space danger. Wolves, wolves are <laughs> wolves, the least known space danger. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is why I love chatting with Amy is because she's so full of, of human stories, but amazing, mind-blowing human stories yeah. tied to space flight. Well, they're, they're what makes it fun. <laughs> and, and one of my other favorite random facts uh, is the astronauts uh, have to carry their passports with them. Yes. Uh, this, so you want to tell us about that one? Um, well, if you know the details about what's happening with it now, jump in. But I do, my favorite sort of customs issue with space is when Apollo 11 splashed down and they came into Hawaii, they they had they were technically out of the country and they had to pass back through customs to get back into the country, which is completely ridiculous. Um, yeah. They splashed down international waters, so I guess technically it makes sense. But it's it's true if you don't if you have an emergency, you don't know where you're going to come down, right? Mm -hmm. You can you can try to wait it out so that you deorbit at a point that brings you down near your recovery ship or on you know in the Russians' case on Russian soil, but. Um, you, you, you never know if you you could way. end up yeah you could end up in like I don't know some some South American country where nobody knows what to do with you or who you are or what language you speak so if you have your identification saying this is who I am and I really am a you know a human belonging to this nation they can send you home better <laughs> and and this was even more of a problem uh, back when we were using the space shuttle because we had U.S. astronauts that would take off here in the United States, go spend time up on the International Space Station, and sometimes come down on Russian ships. And that meant that they had no entrance visa. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how you work out an entrance visa if you're not technically it, passing through customs and get that little... I wonder if they, they have one up there just in case. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a trained like customs that. officer on, on the space station. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's not like they have to, well, I guess they could have to inspect your bags if you're out in, on the ISS. Um, you could come back with something from international space, international territory that uh, doesn't <laughs> I don't know. pass customs. Yeah, I was going to say, like, space germs is probably the cleanest environment ever for that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. Con contraband, contraband fruit? Probably not. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know what? And if they're growing hydroponics in the space station, then it, it could, that all. could be a problem of, of you know, it's like it's like when you go to Australia and they have to, you know, spray the whole plane in case anything comes in with you. They oh, start spraying yeah. the capsule yeah. before you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but some of the astronauts in in the early days actually had to go through quarantine. Uh, yes. Coming back, uh, I know this was something that happened in the Apollo program. What was yeah. the thinking behind that? Um, the thinking was nobody really knew what you would be exposed to in space. Um, so the astronauts did a quarantine before they actually left, and this is really just to make sure that in the period of incubation of any kind of virus that they would be... Um, okay, wait, starting that one again. So the, they, they would stay in quarantine for about three weeks before launch because if they were to get sick, they would have had to be exposed to it before, long enough beforehand that they wouldn't get right. sick in space. Does that make sense? Did I do that right? <laughs> um, yeah. So the idea was a, was a pre-launch quarantine to make sure that they were healthy going in, they would, weren't exposed to anything. Of course, um, the, the famous example is that they kind of dropped the quarantine thing a little bit and relaxed it, and they were still exposed to other astronauts. And Charlie Duke had measles. He had German measles um, and he, when he was on the backup crew of Apollo 13, exposing the prime crew two days before. And uh, what's his name? Oh, my gosh. Ken Mattingly hadn't had them and had to get pulled. So this is, this is sort of to try to prevent people getting things like German measles in space, which probably would be very fun. Mm -hmm. but, but then you don't know what you're exposed to in space, especially going to the moon. You are opening the lunar module to have had the vacuum of space in the lunar environment. Nobody knew if there would be some thing, something in the dust when they brought it in to make them sick, that if they had picked up some kind of space sick or gross or something, you know, instead of infecting the entire world like some bad sci-fi movie, um, they stuck them in a little trailer, and yeah, that's where they, they lived. They had sort of minor 
um, interaction with doctors and sort of care caretakers and everything was done in isolation and um, then they realized that they weren't coming back from the moon with like extra hands screwing up their hand heads or you know loaded with viruses space or anything Ebola. space Ebola there was no space Ebola the only um when the Apollo 12 crew bought, brought back some of the S Surveyor 3 spacecraft, they brought back a few sections of it. It had been on the moon for about three years. There was evidence of organic material in it, which turned out to have been, it just survived on the moon for three years. So that pretty much squashed the idea that there were moon bugs roaming around and threatening to Except destroy everything. Broad. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Or or the rocks that turn into spiders <laughs> as per Apollo eighteen. I don't know if either of you guys saw that, but that's like oh, the wait, worst. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I, I haven't I I haven't heard that one or seen that story. Can uh mm. space rocks that turn into spiders? Yeah, this is the, the movie Apollo eighteen that came out like a year and a half ago, a couple years ago. Oh, no, that's a different one I'm thinking of. Which one um, did you with O. J. Simpson in it? Oh, Capricorn One. Oh, Capricorn One. Yeah, the one that that staged a Mars landing and gave so much fuel to the fire that the moon landings had been faked. Yes. No, a Apollo okay. eighteen is this idea that there was a secret mission to the moon, but it turned out that they they found a dead Soviet crew and a Soviet lander, and all the rocks on the moon turn into these spider things and infect your blood. It just actually um. I spoke to Jerry Griffin about it. Jerry Griffin was a, an Apollo flight director. He was one of the technical consultants on that movie, which when you look at it, it's, it's filmed in very much the same way that the sort of in-flight film was taken. And he said that there was a point where he just, he kind of had to sit back and say, okay, you went from a sort of fun historical fiction to absolute insanity. And it's just, just this point in the movie where it's like, this is just... You just, you lost me. This stopped being fun sci-fi and became, like, really weird and just kind of insane. I, yeah. I can recommend a That's movie. why we haven't been back to the moon. Rocks That's space. why. Spider. <laughs> I think it's because yeah. of the Nazis. I don't know if you've seen the movie oh, no. Iron Sky. <laughs> Have you seen this? It's on Netflix. Uh, it I is. Uh, somebody I was doing a hangout with a while back mentioned it, and I was like, Nazis on the moon? It's a very tongue-in-cheek. I think it's tongue-in-cheek. Maybe they meant to be serious, but I thought it was hilarious. I saw, I've seen the trailer, and it looks like it, it just is a massive joke. It's um, so bad it's good. It's yeah. so bad it's good. Iron Sky, and yet the, basically, um, nice. you know, the U.S. sends astronauts back to the moon finally and find that there's been a secret Nazi colony living there <laughs> since World War II. <laughs> And they are these huge spaceships that come out of the moon, and the Fjordor is oh, it's it's fantastic. Fantastic, <laughs> yeah. I think I um, I think I saw that because <laughs> for like three weeks when I was doing a lot of of pre space flight rocket stuff, and and the Nazis and the German roots of rocketry, Fraser kept making fun of me for talking about space Nazis. So then That's I right. found that this movie exists, and I can't believe there's a movie about space Nazis. <laughs> Of course it's a movie about yeah. space Nazis. Why not? What yeah. better combination could you have for a movie? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what... Uh, oh, I'm going to ask a really general question. What's the most... Um, two things. What's the most inspiring thing about the human space flight program up to this point for you? And what's the most bizarre thing in the human space flight program? Um, huh. I know you know a lot of bizarre things, but maybe you want to start with something really inspiring first and then get into back into the weird. I think, um, hmm, good general questions, Nicole. <laughs> I think the, the probably the most, um, I guess the most inspiring thing would be the pace at which the space program moved in the sort of mid to late 60s around... Um, there's sort of, at the time, sort of around 65, 66, there was this real push that, you know, the end of the decade is looming. You have the Gemini program has just ended, and you don't have, you need to get going to the moon, and you have this mad sort of push. And I think um, I think it's kind of brought together in the Apollo 4 mission, which was the first all-up test of a Saturn V. They'd been testing the pieces individually, and finally, I think it was George Mueller, or Miller as it's pronounced, I think, um, said you can't test every piece of this massive rocket individually. Um, that was the German way, because if you change one thing and the test fails, you know what your variable is. But if you add 
I don't know how many moving parts are in that rocket, but like five million variables, it's going to be a lot harder to nail down what went wrong. But he was like, you're not going to get to the moon if you don't just do it. So they just did it. And they put a full Saturn V with a working command module um, and a, a dummy lunar module for, for ballast and launched it and it worked. And it's sort of like, huh, yeah, would you just do stuff, you can actually make it work. Now, granted, that took a lot of money, and we can't necessarily take that just-do-it approach now, but this is kind of awesome to say you have to get this done, and we're going to make it happen, and to just take the risk and just do it and see something amazing come of it. Um, and I think you and I uh, mourn the fact that we weren't around to see it. Yes. Um, we see the old videos, and, and I know I get all teary, and, and I feel like I missed out on something big, you know? Yeah. I um, Last November was the first time I actually made it to Cape Kennedy, or Cape Canaveral, or yeah. whatever it's called these days. I don't know. <laughs> um, whatever it was called in the 60s, that's what I know it as. Um, and I it's went to Cape, Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Cape Canaveral Space now? Center. Okay. Well, no, no, no. It's, it's both. So I've it's heard, Cape right. Canaveral. Right. And Kennedy Space Center. Right. So the Kennedy Space Center properly then. And I went to the, the Apollo um, Saturn Visitor Center, and they take mm -hmm. you through this sort of like, they simulate the launch of Apollo 8, and they do all these things, and you, they open the doors, and you're just like staring at the business end of the Saturn V, and it's, it's separated into sections, mm -hmm. but it's fully the length of the building, and if anyone has ever seen it, I mean, I've never seen a Saturn V in person. I have models, and I've seen pictures, but like... Uh, yeah, it was one of those things like you open the doors and I just kind of swore <laughs> under my breath. I kind of couldn't believe that it was that big. And I, I tried to watch my language. Um, and I ended up just like staring at it for about an hour and a half because it was just insane mm -hmm. to take in how big that was. I was just thinking, ugh, it's really too bad that I never, nor will I ever see one of these so upright on a launch pad. Hmm? So what got you into spaceflight history then? What made this your passion? Um, for me, it was just, I'd never heard of people walking on the moon when I was a kid. Um, I, I grew up in Canada, for those of you guys watching who don't know, so it's not like I grew up with, like, deep NASA roots and all. We, we I didn't left Canadians this. around here. <laughs> Fraser, Amy, my husband. Oh, your husband's Canadian. Nice. Yeah. Go team. Represent. Um, so, so when I read about it when I was a kid, I just thought, this is the craziest thing ever. I had no idea people walked on the moon. So I started reading about it and then I, I started finding that it's it's so much more than just like this very simple, oh, we decided to go to the moon and here's how you build a rocket and stuff. But it's like this really deep social and political and mm -hmm. really cool technology stuff that is, I mean, I, I love sort of those un, roots untaken and technologies undeveloped stories. Um, but it's massive. And that we, we don't see it all. So I just started digging into it and realized that I, I kind of love it. It's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And I think to answer your bizarre question, I think the most bizarre question, thing that happened is that it actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> it's, sort of, it's sort of when you sit back and look at it, you're like, why the hell did they decide to go to the moon? Like, it's awesome. It was there. But it, it was... was right it was right there. I mean, yeah, it's the easier of all the targets you could have in the solar system. It's the easiest one to get to. But, like, what a bizarre decision to make 20 days after launching an American into space. Just decide to send your nation to the moon. Yeah. Like, granted, people have been thinking about it since about 1955, but... Oh, even early, well, I mean, sci-fi writers have been writing about yeah, it. Yeah, had been writing about it. But there were, there were some, um, like, Sergei Korolev in Russia, he, started, he was the Russian, or the Soviet chief designer, sort of their Von Braun. Um, he, he'd been planning, because he developed the R-7 rocket, he'd been planning sort of how he could develop that technology enough to send a small spacecraft to the moon and had been working out the actual, you know, proper physics and science details, um, which I know, I mean, Jules Verne did. He did a lot of sort of figuring out where to, where you would have to launch a projectile from the Earth to use the right gravity and all that stuff to get to the moon. But I, I think in the sort of mid-50s was the first dedicated studies based on what was happening in rocketry at the time to make it feasible. So I'm, I'm going to interrupt real fast. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at our calendar, and 
I have a 30 minute window when I don't have to be talking and I adore you and I adore <laughs> listening, but I have to be coherent to record astronomy cast yeah. and doing this takes a lot more energy out of me than pulling an all nighter programming I'm learning. Right. So I'm going to leave you in Nicole's five <laughs> fine hands. We are currently... The five hands? <laughs> fine hands. We are currently at $12,705 in donations. You know, it would be a dream come true if that were 15000 when I woke up, but I'd settle for 13000 Do you guys think you can donate $300 in the next 30 minutes? I'll be back. Please don't disappoint. <laughs> Sleep well. <laughs> so Amy is um, part of the Weekly Space Hangout, like I mentioned before, and that is one of the many things that CosmoQuest is involved in. It's one of our weekly hangouts. Um, we have a hangout almost every day of the week. And uh, the um, the weekly space hangout is something that we've put together with Fraser, uh, and that so the money that you're putting towards CosmoQuest helps pay the people to stay in this and to keep doing all this all this work and put out the weekly space news and and the history tie-ins and all that fun stuff um, every week uh, through um, through Google Plus Hangouts, through Universe Today, through CosmoQuest. Um, and so your support, again, helps keep all these things running. So that's CosmoQuest.org slash donate. I'm going to be saying that in my sleep for the next week. <laughs> um, um, uh, oh, we had a question going back uh, whether uh, there had ever been uh, like a light laser communication. Um, recently they had tried a... Uh, signaling the astronauts with the laser uh, searchlights in a blue laser. Uh, was this the first? Have you ever heard of uh, any light signal contact with people in space, if that if that's something you've heard of? Um, like light using... Using a... a so, so not like laser communications in terms of lasers carrying data. Like light. No, in terms of like amateurs using a laser. Right. Um... You can see laser pointers from the space station, can't you? I think that's true. I think with a, a blue might be strong enough. A blue might yeah. be strong enough at that point. Um, um, I don't know if you've heard of that. I know that there yeah. are many opportunities for ham radio operators to communicate with the space station as well. Right. So uh, anyone with ham ham uh, radio experience can can figure out, can find out how to do that. I don't have any links on hand for that, but I know this is something I've I've heard of before. Um, I know there's a. Um... There's a, uh, an array, I'm not sure what exactly it, it is, um, at the Apollo 15 landing site that you can send a laser to and bounce it back to the Earth and pick up yes. that signal. So See, that's not visible, but I know that's, um, it's got yeah. lasers in it. <laughs> yeah, they do that in, in uh, New Mexico at, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the observatory, which is terrible, but it's the same one that did the Sloan survey. Uh, they, they use the 3.5 meter telescope and a green laser to point off the retro reflectors on the moon. So I've actually uh, seen that telescope. Nice. And uh, they had it on Mythbusters, of course, on the moon hoax Mythbusters right. episode. Um, yeah. Robert uh, points out that the, the uh, iron sky thing I came up with before is actually <laughs> based on a real conspiracy theory and that there are uh, reptilian aliens and beneficent Aryan aliens, and so unsurprisingly, that comes from an actual conspiracy theory. So, mm -hmm. yay, world! Uh, we have a serious question though from <laughs> Jeff Borst. Uh, speaking of technologies that weren't developed, what tech that got left behind do you think would have had the largest historical impact had it been developed? Huh, nice one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Make her think. Good <laughs> morning. Ah. Uh. Yeah, morning. Um, While you do that, I'm going to grab coffee, but I'm here. Yes, okay. <laughs> I think probably um, probably the space plane would have been the technology that would have had a really significant effect on the path that space flight did take. Um, so space planes are something that we, we have seen. I mean, the space shuttle was a type of space plane and that it landed like a traditional aircraft. Um, but in, in, the mid, in the early and mid-50s, um, the U.S. Air Force, in conjunction with the NACA, the National Advisory Committee of, on Aeronautics, which is NASA's predecessor organization, um, they were pursuing this great 
vehicle called the Dinosaur, which I love, and probably anybody who's familiar with my, my work has probably seen me write about it and post pictures about how much I love it. Um, the Dinosaur was this uh, triangular vehicle with little flipped up wings in the back. It was designed to be launched on a Titan, uh, a Titan missile by the, its last iteration, it was on a Titan III, so the next uh, version after the Titan II, which launched the Gemini spacecraft. Um, and Dinosaur was, was basically designed to go, go up, orbit the Earth, and um, it could skip off the atmosphere like a stone skips off flat water to kind of keep height, and it could also um, deorbit with retro rockets and glide to a runway landing. Um, the Dinosaur itself was kind of plagued by massive bureaucratic issues. It actually started life, uh, speaking of Nazis, <laughs> it started life as a German anti-podal bomber. It started life as this thing that would be launched on an A-10, which was a, um, a sort of a souped up version of the A-4 slash V-2 that Werner von Braun developed. And it could have launched this, this manned little triangular thing with flipped up wings across the Atlantic Ocean to bomb New York and Washington from wow. Germany. Wow. So one of one of the engineers who developed it and had worked on on the program. He was in charge of the V two, so I knew a lot about this um, this anti portal bomber. When he came to America in the wake of the Second World War, he ended up working for the Air Force and fell, I think. And he brought this idea to the Air Force and said, "You should develop this weapon because it's going to be a good thing for you to have against the Soviet Union." And they did. The the, the Air Force liked it enough to to actually start developing it. And they also saw that it could double as a manned space vehicle when that sort of became something that looks like it might might be on the horizon. Um, the problem was that it went back and forth between being predominantly a weapon system and predominantly a spacecraft. So it was just, it was just, I mean, a bureaucratic nightmare. And it just never, there was a, um, a mock-up was built, but it, it, just it was too far down the, the schedule to sort of okay. actually fly because by by the time it was ready ish to go, um, Mercury was already underway and there was just no way that NASA was going to abandon this super simple capsule thing for this more yeah. complicated space plane. But had I mean, there's sort of this what would have happened? I mean, had Sputnik been five or ten years later, th this could have been developed and we could have had this basically single person shuttle type system ready to go. And that would have, I think that would have changed a lot of things. Um, because the whole, the whole Apollo program sort of followed the model of Mercury of building what you need to answer an immediate need. So yeah. simple capsule, single purpose lunar module, but you build a single person space shuttle. You could have something that's modular, you know, add those individual pieces and go further as opposed to, something for a single purpose that doesn't necessarily apply elsewhere. So I think that had the space plane had a bit more of an edge over the capsule, I think it would have radically changed the way space flight looks now. Yeah, I wonder, would we have still been in such a push to go to the moon had we been the first to put up a satellite? And I know that the, mm -hmm. we were close to doing that, and there's a story behind that as well. Uh, the U.S. was close to putting yeah. up a satellite before the uh, Soviet Union put up Sputnik. Yeah. Well, that's sort of another one that falls under the bureaucratic nightmare category. <laughs> um, there were the, the pre-space flight technology was divided between the military and the NACA, which was a civilian organization. So the Navy had its Vanguard rocket that it was developing, and the Army had its Redstone rocket that it was developing, or the it was also called the Jupiter and something else. Um, all of these things were being developed, and Eisenhower, had, who was president at the time, had to pick one to sort of start the nation's um, mm -hmm. satellite efforts. And it, he really liked Vanguard because it was all American, whereas the, the Army was using imported German engineers. Mm -hmm. So he gave priority to Speaking Vanguard. Of Speaking of Nazis. You can't not talk about Nazis. It's all place. von Braun's fault, man. It's all, it's all Werner von Braun, all the way down. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's my personal cosmology. It's all Werner von Braun's all the way down. <laughs> okay, internet, make um, this a, a meme. Make this a thing. <laughs> yes. This is how I'm going to be famous on the internet. <laughs> Werner von Braun's all the way down. All the way down. Yeah. Um, so, so Von Braun had this rocket, it was the, the Jupiter 
rocket. It's killing me that I can't remember what its other designation was, but mm-hmm. it's part of the Redstone family. And it he was able to launch a satellite in 1956. He actually launched a rocket that had a dummy fourth stage. Had mm-hmm. that stage been active, it would have got a small satellite into orbit over a year before Sputnik. But it didn't. The, the Army didn't have clearance from the President to launch the satellite. The Navy did. And the Navy's vanguard, I think we've all seen that it kind of goes, kind of goes up, and then it just crumples. Um, it's it's one of the saddest things. <laughs> um, it really, it's just, it's kind of painful. I mean, you can just see the the nose cone just falls off. I mean, it doesn't even look like it's attached. It's so yeah. When that after that happened, um, the army was given a two month window in which to launch, and if they couldn't launch in that two month window. It was going back to the Navy to launch a satellite, but Von Braun got his launch in right at the last, I think it was like a day before their window ended. Oh my goodness. He turned a rocket over in 60 days to launch America's first satellite. Oh my goodness. So, yeah. So we have uh, a few more comments coming in. Um, Guido Bibra asks, Amy, has there ever been established, has it ever been established if there was a single moment in which the moon race started? Uh, the Kennedy speech, don't mean the Kennedy speech, but when the actual decision was made and who made it, was it the Americans or the Soviets? And perhaps was it no single point in history and the idea had already just been there? Um, I, I'm going with the no single point. Mm-hmm. It had been there. Um, I mean, like like we kind of said earlier, jokingly, yeah, the moon was there, why not go? But that was actually kind of the idea when space flight first started um, in the wake of Sputnik. There was no NASA to take over space flight, right? So it was all these military channels trying to run these space programs. And a lot of them were starting to look forward at ways they could maintain technological dominance over the Soviet Union and sort of, okay, we see your satellite, we raise you something else. And that something else was a moon landing. So the the Air Force actually had this comprehensive plan to land a man on the moon and bring him back by 1965. Wow, um, and that was presented in early 1958. So this was something that was already in in the thought process, and a lot of these channels, and I mean the NACA people that had been looking at different types of spacecraft and had been looking at the moon, however, you know, non seriously, they came into NASA, and the some of the military people were either came into NASA or were influenced influential within NASA and you know, their rockets came in. So there was a lot of sharing these ideas, but this idea of going to the moon was already something that was out there. And I think it just took, it just took a commitment to make, make it something that had to happen. Okay. Um, and I, I think there were, there were a lot of points too, where it, it could have, things could have gone very differently and they could have canceled the program. Actually, this is, we, we always talk about that Kennedy speech, you know, we choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard. And we don't talk about the speech he made a little over a year later saying we should cancel Apollo and go to the moon with our, the Soviet Union and create a peaceful use of space. Whoa, I totally um, don't know about that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, wow. I'd, have to, I'd have to look up what this was. It was like, it wasn't to Congress. It was one of those meetings of the House things that, that I don't know. I don't know much about America, how American politics works, because it's so complicated. And I just haven't been in it too long. But um, it wasn't a congressional thing. It was a Senate thing or something. But he did make this speech, and there is a very brief mention of maybe, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe the, the cost was what was really getting to him. He was starting to really. Um, there are some tapes that exist of conversations between Kennedy and NASA Administrator James Webb, mm-hmm. where Kennedy is saying, in, in 1962, saying, don't care what you do, just get to the moon. Don't do science, just get to the moon. That's all I care about. And then a year later, he's starting to say, is this going to be the worst decision I ever made and the only thing I'll be remembered for? Oh, and I'm wow. saying, no, you... I, I really think that you're going to remember to be remembered as a hero for putting us on this journey. And, um, but there's still that sort of questioning whether or not it was a good idea that comes through in some of these speeches. And he's still committed, and he's still committed to sort of see the nation seeing it through because it was, you know, he, he started it. <laughs> but there, there were a few subtle calls of maybe we should take our technology and merge it with the Soviet Union and do something peaceful in space because it shouldn't be a battleground. It should be for mankind. 
Wow. Wow. I should go I should go find my the article I wrote on that and you can put it up there for anybody who's yeah, interested. Really. Yeah. Totally do that. Um, so uh, we, we've mentioned uh, Von Braun's all the way down. We've got a couple <laughs> more comments on that. Uh, Jeff Setzer says it's an interesting dynamic in Huntsville, Alabama. See how they treat the legacy of Von Braun and his colleagues. He's a complete hero uh, there, but there's zero mention of his, of his pre-immigration life. Uh, and Helio de George says, um, do you know of the 30s proposal of Von Braun to go to Mars? He estimated 900 trips to orbit to complete three vessels bound for Mars. This is, is this Mars Project with the K? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so he was interested in space flight well before he came to the U.S., right? And so oh, the yeah. history of being involved in using slave labor in the Nazi camps yes. uh, is a tricky, tricky bit of history. Maybe you can talk a, a little bit about the Mars Project. I will warn you, we have 10 minutes left in this hangout before Google shuts it down and we have to start oh. a new one. So. Oh gosh, I talked a lot more than I thought I was going to be able to. <laughs> so the idea with, with the Mars project was that why why go and send emissaries from Earth and send like, you know, two guys, like we did to the moon, you know, why go to Mars, look around for a couple days and then come back. If you go, you should, you know, go, go big or go home, basically. So he had this idea of sending, it was a crew of 70 men in 10 ships, three of which wow. were supply ships. Um, they were all assembled in low Earth orbit, and it was a, something like 900 launches. It was, you know, there were two launch sites in islands in the Pacific, and they would just be, like, around around the clock, just, like, up, deliver, down, up, deliver, down. And this is the space plane that he wanted was to oh, make these okay. landings so they could come down from space, load it up with another piece, back on the launch pad, and pop it right back up. So um, they're building these mass, massive ships in orbit in this plane. Yeah. In Earth yeah. orbit to go. In Earth down. orbit. And then once they're all built in Earth orbit, they all go to, go to Mars. Um, and once they got to Mars, the idea was to send, I think, 20 men at the pole because they thought the poles had snow and that you could yeah. actually land on snow in a kind of glider. So they would, 20, 20 guys would land, um, they build a roving habitat and they would drive it down to the equator where it was thought to be more temperate and um, sort of cleaner space to, to live and work. And they would build a runway and have all the other men come down in their gliders on this pre-made runway. They would always leave one ship ready to launch back up and they'd go about their surface days. I think it was 500 days on the surface. Um, mm -hmm. And then they could all pile into the, the one or two ships that were going to take them back into Mars orbit. Meanwhile, I think their um, cargo ships were still in orbit. Get back in one of those cargo ships as the Earth return vehicle, fly back to Earth, and then take those small glider vehicles back to an Earth landing. Wow. I mean, it was, it was um, I haven't read the technical version. There's there's one called Project Mars, which is kind of a narrative, um, which is still pretty dense because he's an engineer, not a, not a writer. Um, but then there's also Mars, a technical tale, which is the actual science behind it. And I, I haven't actually read it, nor am I enough of a scientist to really understand it. But I hear that it, it's actually like a, a solid plan. I mean, the one problem is the landing because you couldn't have a glider like that on Mars. But right. um Apparently, it's it's not a bad plan for someone who wrote, wrote it, I think, in, it was published in German in 1947. So, that's, that's, yeah. I think, I think, I feel like, I, I remember the name of it with K, because I researched yeah. that uh, when I was an undergrad. Yeah, um, but the I don't German the is details. with a K. Yes, <laughs> German was with a K. Um, yeah. Or his project. Um, and so, yeah, being such a big radical plan for, uh, it sounds like a margin, Mars invasion fleet. It, it does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that there were Martians to invade, but that that's something going along. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jeff Borst adds, uh, Amy, if you don't write at least a single volume on the obscure side of space history, you're missing out <laughs> on an opportunity to get lots of books sold. I think it's been uh, interesting and accessible to lots of people. So can I, book can I get that in writing to, to help entice someone to give me a book deal? <laughs> no, yes, we're all going to write uh, a publisher and say we will buy yeah. Amy's book. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's all, here. all I'll say on this is it's a hard sell to sell obscure space history. Yeah. But yeah. I know that there are people like you guys out there who would read it. Well, and you know, you are, oh, as, as, as we are often to say, uh, probably the hardest working writer on the space beat. Nice. <laughs> 
Can you list all of the places <laughs> that are publishing your work? Yeah. How many hands um, do you need? Five hands? <laughs> I think I got it on two. Okay, good. Um, so I'm with, I'm with Discovery News, uh, Motherboard, um, Device, Al Jazeera English. I do I host videos at Scientific American. Uh, it's a monthly video. It's called It Happened in Space. Um, you can see it on the YouTube Space Lab channel. Um, I freelance when I can at Ars Technica and at I've done a bit with the Crux blog at Discover Blogs. Um, I think I'm missing something. Oh, my own blog, Vintage Space. Um, that one, little, it has fallen a little bit by the wayside. I'm kind of waiting to get all my stuff together and start chronicling my space best adventures. Um, I think that's it. I think that's it. How many fingers was that? That was, that was seven, I think. <laughs> seven fingers. So those are all the places where you can see Amy's work, uh, in addition to watching the weekly space hangout on Fridays at noon Pacific. Um, and so, uh, yeah, through the stuff we've been doing, I'm going to do the station plug again for CosmoQuest. Uh, CosmoQuest.org is where we're doing all these amazing projects, and it's through um, Fraser and the Weekly Space Hangout that I actually got to meet Amy and just like to pick her brain for all the space history knowledge. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed you're so coherent. Yeah, me too. <laughs> And uh, it's it's I think it's 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 kind of nice to talk to someone who's uh, you know a woman of a similar age because usually all the space history buffs are the guys who were there watching it happen. Yeah. Uh, and so it's kind of nice. Definitely true. The number of times I go to these events and people look at me and they go, "You don't look like you should be here. Why do you know about this stuff?" And it's like. <laughs> You're a big space nerd. You can be yeah. a space nerd at any age. So yeah, that is. It's kind of cool to see. <laughs> To um to to talk with you because I know we're coming from a similar place in in culture and age yeah. and, and uh, so that that is always fun as well. But your your knowledge is expansive. So uh, yeah, thank you for always sharing that with us. Um, in the last few minutes before Google Hangouts kicks us off, um, do you have what are you working on now? Do you have any plans for the future uh, other than the book that you've obviously been commissioned to write? <laughs> yes, thank you. I should I should crowdfund a, a book deal or something. something. <laughs> I don't know. Figure out how to kickstart that. Um, I, what am I doing right now? Looking at other than you, moving. Other than, other than moving. This is, this is all my stuff is, is here. So I'm sort of like trying to pick small things right now. Um, I'm looking a little bit at so early Soviet space stations right now, like the Salyut mm -hmm. program. I don't actually know that much about it. Um, so I thought it'd be fun to write write about it and learn a bunch of stuff and put that into the context of sort of cooperation in space. And I think it's interesting just in like, because you're talking in the weekly space hangout that China doesn't have access to the International Space yeah. Station. It made me think a little bit about how space stations have developed and how they should have developed based on sort of, you know, Von Braun's early proposal of a space station for humanity from which these missions to Mars could launch. So uh, doing some of that. Uh, what else am I doing? Ah, looking, looking uh, Brian some... Consell has come to the rescue once again from uh, Mad Art Lab. He is working on a Von Braun all the way down image. Yes. So we have an artist <laughs> working on it. Thank you. Oh, I feel like I should just stop asking the internet and just ask Brian from now on because he does amazing stuff. Awesome. Uh, he came. They came up on Mad Art Lab. They came up with um, an amazing drink for Yuri's Night as well. So you can go check that out at Mad Art Lab. Type in Yuri's Night because I asked the internet and they delivered. So anyway, yes. sorry. Thanks, Thanks. internet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mad Art Lab. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so early sorry, so early Soviet <laughs> space stations. Early Soviet space stations, and uh, once I get all my stuff unpacked, I'm probably going to be digging into some of those more into some of the pre NASA space flight stuff because yeah. that's always really really kind of weird and it's yeah it's interesting to note that you know NASA wasn't created in a vacuum with yeah. the ability to go to space it came no pun somewhere intended. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's kind of the stuff that I'm I'm kicking around these days, cool. looking at some context. I like context. <laughs> yes, that, that you definitely deliver yeah. the context, which is fantastic. It's fun. Um, I don't want Google to. I, I want to keep talking with you, but uh, Google's going to kick us out. Um, I, Come I on. Have to check Aren't you guys thing. tight with Google now? Can't you get them to extend the CosmoQuest hangout so you guys can I just? No, we mentioned this to Fraser earlier because he's visiting with them next week, which is why <gasps> this Friday Amy is hosting the weekly Yay! hangout. 
<laughs> uh, I'm doing teacher pre professional development and Fraser's at Google again. So Amy will be hosting this week. So I well. see her inaugural hosting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, before Google kicks us out, I am going to end this one uh, and thank Amy for talking with us and giving us the Space History Beat. Go to Vintage Space. From there, you can see all of her work on all of the different places where she writes. Um, and uh, yeah, Amy, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, and yeah. good luck with you, all your all your funding goals, and and have a good sleep in a few hours. I've been checking in with you guys. I'm really oh, impressed at your intuitiveness oh. with this one. This is serious. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna hurt, and then I got I got I got to be up 7:30 in the morning tomorrow, so it's gonna be fun. Oof. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're going to switch. Uh, what we've been doing every four hours is I've been ending a broadcast and starting a new one and changing all the YouTube links. So come along with me, check the Twitter, check the main event page, and we will keep sharing the link and keep going. So thank you very much. I will see you guys in a few minutes. Bye, Bye guys. Click the button. for three days. I think she had 48 orbits in about a little under 70 hours. And um, she was a trained parachutist before she became a cosmonaut, which was good because like like they did in the Vostok dates, she ejected from her capsule at the last minute um, and landed by a parachute in a field somewhere. <laughs> That is, is so totally <laughs> insane. You are in a capsule descending from space. You have undergone calcium uh, degener decalcification of your bones. Uh, you have just finished ex decelerating multiple Gs. And now you're going to jump out of a moving spacecraft and parachute? Yes. <laughs> you have to maintain that much presence of mind, somehow physicality. Um, I, I think it was on Vostok 2 that German Titov exercised by doing like isometric contractions, like pushing against his control panel because they had nothing, nowhere to move. And they're like, we need to make sure that your muscles don't completely atrophy because you have to land on your own legs and survive. So he would be like pushing against these things and like contracting his abs to make sure that he stayed in shape, which, you know, after three days in space, you're not suffering that much bone density loss or muscle sort of weakening, but still, you know, <laughs> worry. Yeah, that's, that's not a comfortable situation to and, imagine. And the part you're leaving out is they launch with a shotgun in case they come down where there's wolves. Yes, yes. that's the difficulty of landing yes. on land as opposed to in the water. <laughs> yeah, well, we have sharks. I don't, just think, don't, I don't think NASA sent the, sent the, the astronauts up no. with, like, like uh, Triton spears, you know, those... those Harpoons. Uh, <laughs> Harpoons, that's the one. <laughs> like the little mermaid's dad had, those things. <laughs> Get up and crumble through boxes. But, yeah, that's the one I carry in my purse just to, uh, you know... Conversation starter. It's a conversation starter. Well, what's really great is I do this when I meet... Um, when I meet, you know, engineers or space people, I can pull this thing out of my purse and say, this is the stuff that I work on. And then when I follow up for interviews or information and stuff, I can say, I was that kid with the space toy in her purse. And they're like, oh, yeah, you. <laughs> so uh, it makes me memorable. We'll call it that. That's always helpful. That is always helpful. So today there's a, a, a rather major anniversary in women's space flight. Yeah. Uh, something that we mentioned on the uh, Space Hangout on Friday. Maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about that here as well. Since we have all ladies in the chat right now. It's all, it's all ladies. Um, sorry, I missed the green room. Should I put up my lower third? Can I do that? Sure, go for yes, it. Please. It's, fi it's fine. Yeah. We, know, we know you're old hat at this. So <laughs> A little sad face that you didn't go say hi to him, but that's, that's I, um, okay. I don't. I didn't. I didn't get the notice. I'm not okay. sure what's going on with. Um, I don't know if it's a circle issue, but um, yeah. So the anniversary that's today, we're. And it seems like it's been a bit of a quiet one online. I don't know if you guys have seen more noise about this, but it's the 50th anniversary of women in space. Um, today, in 1963, Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman to go into orbit. Um, her her mission, just sort of in brief, was the she was the pilot of Vostok 6, which was the last spacecraft of the Vostok program, and she flew a joint mission with Vostok 5. Uh, I can't remember the cosmonaut's name off the top of my head, but I can look it up. Um, they they flew a joint mission that was it was very similar to the Vostok three four mission that wasn't a rendezvous in orbit but by virtue of their orbits they just happened to pass close to each other in orbit so it looked 
like they were doing a lot of stuff together and they kind of chatted in space but um it was she was up in space <laughs> uh and funnel cake spiral galaxies m51 and m101 does that give me a chance to go blah, 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 hey. <laughs> m51 is grand design oh whatever <laughs> okay sorry i yelled into my mic please hey. forgive me i'm sorry i'm going squee amy's here Yay! Hi, amy. it's michael over, over to fm radio how are you we need your audio, Amy. Amy, you're muted. Okay, how about now? Oh, wait. Yay! Yeah. How about now? Yes, we can hear Wonderful. you. Good. Yay, sorry, new computer. I forgot that I had to install the whole thing. You look to great. Make it work. How? It's good to meet your voice again. Hello. Yeah, because the last <laughs> time I, I saw a picture of you on, because uh, I, I follow oh, your yeah. Google Plus feed, you didn't look quite as good. Yeah, I had a tube down my nose. That was less yeah. fun. <laughs> now, did you take, we were arguing online whether you took that picture, was that a selfie or did somebody take that picture? No, I, I took that. You oh, took you did that. take it. I okay, did, so, yeah. Nicole, you were right. I had, I, I had, I had very uh, little to do in the hospital. <laughs> I had uh, my my argument was that you, somebody took that picture and you were hoping the tube was a little longer so you could strangle them with it. But uh, no, no, if it's a selfie, then, then no, it good. was it was my own doing. No. Yeah. Well, you sound great. It's good to see you in the new place with all the boxes behind yeah, you. Yeah, I still haven't unpacked my office. I have no. bookshelves to be built on the floor, but That'll had an nice. IKEA related injury last night, so oh, no. tackle it again today. <laughs> How are you guys holding up? We're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so just to let you know, I haven't unpacked my office fully yet, and I've been here for a little over a year. Yeah. So <laughs> how do you get but, your things? It's driving me crazy that I'm trying uh, it's to just research things, write articles, and I can't get my books. It's just the stuff I need the least is still are still in boxes <laughs> in a corner, and it's like just piles of old paperwork at this point. <laughs> <laughs> to go like shark tridents, tridents. That's the one. <laughs> Um, no, I don't think there was like a little travel trident. <laughs> Would have been good though. Um, but apparently, I actually learned from um, Isa astronaut Samantha. I can't remember how to pronounce her last name. She's going up in 2015, I think. Astro, I think she's Astro Sam on Google Plus and on Twitter. But um, she actually commented on that article and told me that they do still have guns in the Soyuz official emergency Soyuz pack. They still um, land they on land, so yeah. They still land on land. They don't, they haven't actually taken a gun up in a few years, but it is still listed as one of the official safety precaution measures that's included in their landing but, kit. <laughs> but when did they last have to take a gun out? I, I, I think the only, the only time I know of off the top of my head that they actually took the gun out was in 1965 after, after the Voskhod 2 capsule came down in a forest in the Ural Mountains and they there were wolves around and they had they were in such deep snow and in such deep woods that nobody could actually get to them to get them out. Um, so they had to spend a week or a night, a week would be terrible, a night in the forest. Um, they had to kick off the door of their capsule to get out. Um, this was the mission on which uh, Alexei Leonov had made the first spacewalk, and he was drenched in sweat from the oh. physical exertion of maneuvering in space and trying to get back in the tiny airlock. Yeah. Um, and, you know, their, their long underwear was soaked through, and then he's sitting in, like, negative 30-degree temperatures overnight in the snow, and they can hear wolves. They're like, all right, we're going we're gonna to try to get as safe as possible. Their capsule was wedged in trees, and they managed to get back inside it but couldn't shut a door, so they were open, and they had the gun in case the wolves came, and rescuers did see them, but they were, like, you know, farmer planes. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that sounds about right. Yep, yep, yep. So, Amy, uh, you, of course, are one of our regulars on the Weekly Space Hangout. It's so good to have you back after your move uh, across the continent and between yeah. countries. So, uh, yay, awesomeness. Um, and you are the really the guru of, of manned spaceflight history. Of, of, of <laughs> so. What a title. <laughs> you are, you know, you just, you just know so much. And I wish you had uh, unpacked some more of your space models. I don't know if you have no. any on hand. I have, well, I have a couple. I have the Apollo uh, command service module. And Excellent. the lunar module can come around. You can't, you can't see them. I don't have a place that I can okay, put them. Okay, they were never... The truth now, they were never really packed in a box. They traveled in your purse the entire way, right? No, my, my actually, I do have a miniature one that I carry in my purse at all times. Oh, that there's one is the space cat. Oh, yes, this is Pete Conrad, the cat. Ah. 
The internet is full of cats. It is, and so is my desk right now. They're having a lot of fun exploring my new furniture. So oh, I apologize for when a cat butt just kind of wanders across. <laughs> Welcome to my life. <laughs> Tim moved in with his cat, and I get jinx butt all the time. And I'm a <laughs> little nice. Amy, I stuck around just long enough to say hi because I just had to say hi to you. It's been so long, but if you ladies will excuse me, i got to get some stuff ready on astronomy.fm for a British program coming up this afternoon. So, uh, Nicole, Pamela, I'm here if you need me. Thank you Thank so, you much, so much, Michael. Thanks. You're it's welcome. good to say hi, Michael. It's been an Michael. amazing help. Yeah. We'll talk to you ladies soon. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, so Amy. Yeah, so when I first met Amy in person finally at Science Online, you actually did have uh, some, I think it was a lunar module in your purse. Yeah, it's, that's the one I usually carry. It's, it's just out of reach right now. I don't want to 